Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Kate Titus from Loyal Companion. Happy to be here with you today. Um, we're going to be talking about knuckling today, uh, something that a lot of um, mobility challenge dogs, a lot of senior dogs, um, you'll see that in them. And, and I have folks come in and describe it in a lot of different ways and and uh, and and say they notice it or when they thought, oh, I, I don't really know what that is. Um, so I thought to, I thought knuckling would be a good topic to uh, to cover and, and give you a uh, an idea of <clears throat> what it is, um, what it, what causes it, and uh, and how to deal with that, and some things you can do to uh, to help your dog's uh, paws and legs uh, be moving and keep moving the way they should. So uh, we're going to be talking about that this morning. So when you uh, when you come online with us, go ahead and give a wave and and uh, introduce yourself. I always like to know who I'm talking to out there. Um, and if you're watching this on replay, <clears throat> uh, be sure and type in a replay. And remember, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. I do swing back in and answer those. Um, good morning, Anne. How are you? It's uh, it's good to, uh, to hear from you. Um, again, we're going to be talking about knuckling this morning. And um, uh, knuckling is, a, like I said, a pretty common uh, thing to see in uh, mobility challenge dogs, especially with rear limb issues uh, and some senior dogs. Um, so, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's go ahead and and uh, and get started. Um, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about knuckling, what it is, uh, why it happens, what causes it, um, how you can manage it, and and basically what to do about it, um, and and go from and go from there. And remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. I love it when that comes up, um, so we can cover as much uh, as much information and questions that are important to you. So make sure you uh, pop those in there. Uh, if you have those. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what knuckling is. So this is kind of a knuckling 101. So knuckling itself is a loss of conscious proprioception. Um, and conscious proprioception is defined as the body's ability to uh, to sense its location and its movement and its actions within the environment, within the world. So um, and in relation to other parts of the body. So basically, short short version is, you know where your body is in time and space, and so does your dog. And the reason that um, that we're able to do that, and the reason we're able to move freely um, through space and through our environment, is that the body is constantly communicating with itself. With itself, individual um, uh, uh, down to the to the toes. Um, there are uh, receptors within the body. They're called proprioceptors, um, aptly enough, and those are within the muscles and the tendons and the joints. So, every the body needs to know where all of those are to be able to move. So, the most common um, uh, and easiest, probably to to understand um, motion that I can show you, is I want you to. I want everybody to close their eyes, and I want you to take your index finger, like so, hold it out to the side as far as you can. Now close your eyes, touch your finger to your nose. Now, you couldn't use your vision to draw your finger to your nose, right? Because your eyes were closed. So the only way you can do that is by the proprioceptors firing and telling your finger where your nose is in relationship to the environment and the rest of your body. So your dogs do the same thing. They have a similar mechanism um, that works for them. So <clears throat> the conscious proprioception piece, it, it sounds complicated, but uh, and it is, but in, in its most base form, um, it's body awareness. Where is my body? Where are the parts of my body in relationship to the floor, the walls, the rest of my body? Um, and when your dog moves, that's why they don't walk into doors, or maybe they do because they have a loss of conscious proprioception, um, why they avoid obstacles, why they step over curbs rather than tripping on them, um, because the body is communicating with itself. So if we think about um, uh, the central nervous system, okay, so you've got your brain, you've got your spine, and then you've got all the peripheral nerves that are coming off from there. Uh, so there is information coming from the brain. So as I'm moving my hand, my brain is is uh, unconsciously telling my hands to move um, 
to describe what I'm trying to say. Uh, so brain sends a signal down the spinal cord and from the cord out to the peripheral nerves, and that tells my fingers to move. Now, my fingers also send information back up the peripheral nerves to the spine, to the brain, <clears throat> to tell them what they feel. That's where senses come in. That's where texture, heat, how many of us have, have touched a hot burner more than once? Not too many, because you put your hand down and you pull it away immediately because there's danger there. You don't want to do that. So now you know that if I touch that, that's going to hurt. So you don't want to do it in the same way that you may have a dog who doesn't want to walk across a slippery floor. He knows that he slipped there, so he doesn't want to do that. Okay. He doesn't want to walk across that floor. So <clears throat> A lot of what we'll see when we're when we're talking about knuckling, and I'll I'll show you some pictures of of what it is in just a second. Um, it's not um, it's not a, a a disease or an injury into itself, um, although it can cause them can cause sores. It can cause uh, nails to wear down to the quick until they bleed. But it's usually indicative of some other condition, injury, or disease process that's happening behind the scenes. Um, something that's causing weakness in the front legs or the back legs. Um, something that's causing an interruption of the nerve flow back and forth um, to the brain. Um, so when we talk about, when we talk about knuckling, um, I'm going to show you a couple of videos here uh, that I think will illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, first one I'm going to show you is um, Sage, and Sage has a new uh, stifle brace, a new knee brace. And one of the things we see uh, when we put these on for the first time, especially with a dog that has uh, um, some nerve deficiencies, is that they knuckle. They walk on top of their paws. Um, so in this case, in Sage's case, she's not picking up her paw enough to swing it through and put it down. So when you watch her walk and, and knuckle over the top, I'll give you a pretty good example. Okay, let's take a look. So you can see the knuckle there walking on top of the paw. Good, then come on back. Right. Sage is a very sweet girl. A little bit. She's doing a pretty good job. And she's going to knuckle a second here on a very perfectly placed fit bone so you can't see it. And she does like her tennis balls. Bless her heart. There's a knuckle again. So walking on the top of the paw. That's a good example of, of that. Okay. So next one I want to show you. This is Poppy. And Poppy has um, uh, a neurologic condition. She's in a cart. Um, and you'll see the knuckling and, and kind of the last lack of control uh, of the back end and of the paws, and you get another good look at that. Let's take a look, Poppy. Yeah, go on, buddy. Go on, go get him. See if you can okay. see just the gentle That's knuckling there, God. right there at the end. That was Poppy. Poppy did a good job of coming back from that. Okay. So one of the other things um, is you don't always see knuckling right away. Um, so you'll see uh, nail scrape, maybe you'll hear nail scraping. I'll have uh, folks describe uh, their dog is shuffling when they walk or they'll hear scraping when they walk on the road or the, or the cement. Best thing you can do is one, use all of your senses. So you're gonna, um, you're gonna look for changes in the dog's nails and paws. Uh, you're going to look for sores on top of the knuckles. Um, you're going to look at the the nails uh, and see, you know, are they oddly shaped, angled. Um, you're going to listen uh, for that scraping. Um, and you're going to, to feel the toenails as well. You're going to feel how differently worn the nails are. So let's take a, let's take a quick look at some nails here. Um, so this is a dog who does not um, uh, doesn't scrape their toenail. This was Beamer. So Beamer's nails, and it's kind of hard to tell with the black floor, but Beamer's nails do not um, are not worn down. They're pretty even here. Okay. Now this is Max, and Max does knuckle. So you can see how much shorter these first these nails three and four. So remember that the numbering is one with the dew claw, two with, with the, uh, the first nail 
toward the inside, and then this is three and four. You can see how those are worn down. And you can also see there's the beginning of hair loss right there on his knuckles. Um, he's actually been um, uh, knuckling and scraping his nails for quite some time, and you can see it on both on both paws. Um, um, so this is this is an example of a dog who, if they aren't knuckling now, is going to be knuckling soon. They're not picking up their paws um, when they walk. So there's um, uh, when you're looking at when you're looking at the nails, sometimes you'll see a very sharp angle to them. So it'll almost be like a, a point, like someone has cut cut off half of the nail. That's because when the dog is swinging swinging through, they can't lift up the leg enough to swing through. So it comes through at an angle. And this nail, so number four scrapes and comes down and sometimes number three gets in. So when you think about your dog's paw, whether it's a front or a back, because this can happen in the front or the back, uh, remember dew claws number one, number two is on the inside, number five is on the outside. These two are shorter than these two, three and four. So three and four are your big weight bearing toes. So those are the ones that are gonna scrape or knuckle, okay? Um, <clears throat> So like I said before, scraping and knuckling in and of itself are not, um, uh, are not injuries in and of themselves. They are usually indicative um, of, of something else. Uh, and when I say something else, let's talk about what those common causes are. Um, we see uh, they're usually nerve related or something that has caused a weakness in the limbs, whether that's front or back, and this can affect front or back. We see it more often in the back, uh, but it does happen in the front. <clears throat> and I'll show you a quick video um, of it happening in the front here in just a second. Uh, but we're going to see it with uh, diseases like degenerative myelopathy, um, where the nerve, uh, the nerve sheath, the thing that protects the nerve um, as it comes off the spine, uh, those that sheath is being worn down and so the nerve is slowly dying so the signals aren't getting back and forth from the brain to the spine to the uh, uh, to the extremities to the the paws uh, a sciatic nerve injury if anyone has ever had um, a sciatic pain I was down for a long time last year in May uh, with sciatic nerve pain it is uncomfortable, but it also made me very conscious of where I was going to put my right foot because I couldn't really feel my toes and I had to be really careful that I didn't trip. So same thing with your dog. If that sciatic nerve is involved, that's going to control the swing of the paw to bring it up and put it down. Um, intervertebral disc disease, so um, that's a ruptured disc is, is usually how that manifests. Um, that's what Half Moon has. Uh, you'll remember that Kahlua um, my uh, foster boxer from last year, she had degenerative myelopathy. So we, we saw her when she was still functioning, we saw her uh, knuckling quite a bit. Any spinal cord injury uh, has a potential to cause knuckling. Um, when we're talking about the front, we're talking about brachial plexus. So that's that big trunk of nerves that helps control everything on the front, on the front limb. So from the shoulder, the elbow, all the way down to the paw. Uh, same thing with the radial nerve, which actually just runs uh, on the other side. Um, and let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at Pup. Uh, Pup was hit by a car. And I'm happy to report that Pup is no longer in this cart, which is fantastic, but he still has um, what I believe to be um, a brachial plexus injury. And you'll see what I'm talking about with the, uh, the knuckling in the front. So let's take a look at Pup. So you can see that left side knuckling over. All right. So pup, um, like I said, pup has an injury to uh, to probably the the brachial plexus there in the front. Now the other thing, uh, one of the other common causes of this is uh, uh, an FCE or fibrocartilaginous uh, embolism, so also known as a spinal stroke. So um, <clears throat> some debris has been uh, released into. Uh, into the spinal cord, basically, and and nothing should be <laughs> in the spinal cord. So it can uh, uh, it can interrupt the nerve flow as well, and you can see uh, issues in with the front legs or with the back legs, or sometimes both, um, if we're talking about an FCE. 
So um, now that you kind of know what it is, um, let's talk a little bit more about what are you going to do about it? Um, so first thing you want to do, if you notice that your dog is knuckling, is you want to get in touch with your veterinarian. If you notice that they're scraping as well, you want to get in touch and you want to talk about that because that's usually, like I said, indicative of something else going on. Um, it could be, you know, it could be arthritis. That's another one that it could be because that's going to limit um, or hinder a function of a hip or a knee or a, maybe an ankle maybe an elbow or a shoulder, anything that is involved in picking it up and putting the, the paw down. So if, if the function of the knee or the stifle or hip isn't quite right, then the dog isn't able to lift up enough to put the paw down. So there's going to be scraping or possibly knuckling on top. So until you find out what um, process is behind disease or injury, uh, is behind the knuckling, what's causing that as a symptom, because the knuckling is a symptom, um, you can't really address that. So figure out what's going on. That could be blood work. It could be a full uh, exam or evaluation. Uh, it could be x-rays. It could be all the way up to a CT or an MRI to determine what's happening. But it's kind of a, it's kind of a canary in the coal mine, in, in my opinion, uh, when we start to see any sort of that that knuckling or the rolling on the top of the paws uh, that we've got something else um, something else going on down there um, uh, that's behind that. So um, once you once your veterinarian figures out what's um, what the underlying condition is, then uh, she or he are going to address that underlying condition. Um, hopefully, will help with the knuckling and will either stop it or limit it. Uh, but there are times when knuckling is something that's uh, that you're going to end up managing. So um, because it's a symptom, you're really your goal is to um, limit the amount of damage that the paw or the nails incur um, during the uh, during this process. So um, some of the ways we do that is um, through devices, um, exercises, uh, and, and figuring out you know what kind of activity is appropriate. So if you know you have a dog that's scraping and you go walking on cement, uh, pavement, uh, sharp rocks, so we have to keep the dog moving, but you also have to protect the dog's paws and nails. So you don't want to add um, insult to injury, as you might say. Um, you want to make sure that you protect that as much as you can. So when you're looking for um, or for a device or when you've gone to someone that can help you look for a device, some of the things that, that we're thinking about is um, this: the device should be lightweight. So the way in which we keep um, the paw in the proper position or protect the paw should be lightweight. A lot of these dogs are already compromised in some way. They're already having a challenge lifting their foot. So you don't want to put something that's heavy or thick on that paw uh, because that just guarantees that they're not going to get it through. Um, I have folks that come in all the time and they've they've done the best they can. They bought boots. They wanted to protect their dog's paw, but now the dog is completely landing on top of the paw because they can't lift up the boot enough to put it down. So we have to look for something that's lightweight, doesn't have a super thick tread. Um, and it's within the dog's ability to be able to manipulate whatever you put on there, whatever that, whether it's a boot or a bandage. Um, it's also important that whatever we put on the paw is going to help position it properly. Because one of the things that you want to do is you want to, you want to practice uh, you want to you want to practice it correctly. So when the dog is walking, it does us no good to have a piece of equipment that just allows the paw to go wherever it wants to. We're not we're not training any nerves when we do that. Remember, when we're talking about neurologic issues, one of the most important things is we need to keep sending traffic down that's down those roads. If you think about the nervous system as a as a highway system, it's it's under construction. If, if the nerves are interrupted. So we got to keep sending traffic down it or it just, it, it ends up getting completely blocked and nothing gets through. So being able to continue to send that nerve traffic and where that develop that muscle memory of where is my paw supposed to be when I put it down? Is it supposed to be this way or is it supposed to be this way? So reinforcing the proper way for the dog to put the foot down 
is going to be important as well. You know, and the other thing, and I'm a, I, I talk a lot about independence and letting the dog uh, provide as much um, support and effort as possible. You want a device that's going to help them, but not help them too much. Only as much as they need. Um, because we could, we could stop knuckling by putting them in a full orthosis or brace that doesn't allow them to move the paw at all. But is that too much? Is that too much movement? Uh, is, I'm sorry, is that too much of a restriction? So finding that happy medium um, is important as well. And one of the things that I think it's overlooked a lot is how strong are the legs in general? So if the dog can't swing the leg through at all, it doesn't matter if we can keep the paw in the proper position because the dog can't swing the leg through. So maybe there's a hip or a knee problem. So it's going to change which device you choose based on the strength of the limb itself that we're trying to move. And, you know, sometimes this is just one paw. Uh, but like when we saw on Max, the German Shepherd, it was two right? They were both and called bilateral. They were both down. So he was scuffing on both of them and he was weak on both back legs. So there are different types of products that will allow you to address both of those, uh, both of those situations. Um, now there are um, uh, products on the market that you can that you purchase on your own that don't require um, a veterinary referral or a veterinarian to, to order it and fit you fit it for you. Um, there are some that um, fit between the toes. So there's a there's a, a rope or a um, elastic that fits between the toes to keep the toes in an upright position. Uh, those work great for two to five minute uh, training sessions. Those are not designed to be um, used long term uh, for more than that two to five minute section or you end up with wearing. It's like, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I've never been able to wear a flip flop that has the little thing in the center. Always wore my toes. Does this, that's the same thing that happens to the dogs. It's just too much friction and too much pressure on those, uh, on those toes, on those toes. Um, the other thing to think about is we, we talked earlier about conscious proprioception. Um, some of the products that work the best also, um, remove a lot of the opportunity for the dog to get that feedback, that conscious proprioception. So remember when the dog puts their paw down, there's information that's coming from the bottom of the paws from those uh, proprioceptors, proprioceptors. So that information is coming in, going all the way up to the brain, the brain response and said, okay, you need to do this. Um, uh, whether that be unknuckle your paw or you need to land flat. Um, a lot of the products have um, a, a boot that will keep the entire paw in its proper position. So we have to kind of weigh what benefits we want. So if I have a dog that I need to keep moving, uh, Max is a great example. German Shepherd, about 12 years old. Um, he came to us with probably middle of the road degenerative myelopathy. He was probably stage two or so. Um, and uh, he wanted to keep moving. He was active in his uh, in his mom's life. Uh, she owned a, a, a dojo, so she would he would go and and uh, be on the mat when uh, she did kids classes. So we needed to keep this guy going, but we needed to protect his paws. So we put him in a product called a toe up, uh, which I'll show you a video here in a second um, of a different dog in that. But that was great for him but it did shut off a lot of the proprioceptive um, information coming back. Uh, that, that feedback from the ground was lost as it went through the boot. Okay. It's like the difference between walking in your shoe and walking barefooted. You get a lot more information when you're barefooted than when you have a shoe on. So let's take a look at um, Tatum. Uh, Tatum had such bad sores uh, on her paw that you'll see that there's some red um, red tape all the way up her ankle. That is uh, to protect the sores that she had developed from knuckling so badly. So the product that she's wearing is called a toe up. It's from Orthopets, and that's a, a group that I've worked with for more than 10 years now. Um, and their products do a great job. So this is Tatum. Good girl. Good job, baby. Go on. Good 
So you could see how much more Tatum would lift up that paw that had the boot on it. So there was a there was a very pronounced pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down, um, and that came from the mechanism of the of the boot keeping the paw in an upright position. Without that boot, she would have been walking directly on her knuckles. Um, so when we're thinking about living with a dog who has um, who is knuckling or has some proprioception issues. Um, one of the things that I like to, to talk about is making sure that we get, uh, that you're mindful of the surfaces that you're walking them on. So if you know you have a dog that drags or that knuckles, um, don't walk them on surfaces like asphalt, cement, rocks, um, dirt, dusty dirt around here. Uh, it's really just gonna scuff up the skin. So you need to, to make sure that you have something to protect that paw if you need to walk um, on those surfaces. The other thing to remember is wet paws um, rip up a whole lot faster. I know that I have to be very careful with Half Moon when he's walking around um, in my office because our office floors are uh, rubber. So that friction on the rubber can create um, uh, the opportunity for the skin just to get just pulled right off and to really get rubbed off. So you want to be careful about that. So uh, we talked a little bit about practicing it right, you know, getting the foot placement the way that it should be. Uh, so the other thing that I recommend for folks who have dogs who knuckles is that you know, you practice, you practice asking them to lick, to lift up their paws. So you think about, well, how do you do that? Well, there are some very specific um, exercises that you can do. So think about uh, things that, uh, and activities that require your dog to um, assess where they are in space, where's their body in relationships to other things, other things in the environment, whether those be um, Cavaletti rails, which are hurdles, uh, a small ladder, um, any obstacles that are in their way, even where is their body in relationship to the floor. Um, so we, I usually recommend some exercises like a, like a weight shifting, which is nothing more than having your dog stand in front of you and you just applying gentle pressure on either side. Um, the, uh, the other one that works really well for this and the dogs love it is a good butt scratch. So if they come up to you and, and they want to have their butt scratch, scratch their butt and you can watch their paws go up and down. That's a weight shift. Uh, and that's, that's good. And obviously they love to have their butt rubbed. Stepping over obstacles, no matter how low they are, um, changing directions. So thinking about like a weave or a figure eight. I mean, these are things you can do on your walk too. Even if you weave around stop signs or light posts or trash cans, whatever it has it happens to be, um, maintaining their standing position. So we talked a little bit about a weight shift. So now if we, instead of moving their body, what if we make the floor underneath them move? So that's where things like wobble board, which move in all directions, or a rocker board, which moves front and back. Um, or if we ask them to stand with maybe just three legs instead of all four, they really have to concentrate on where those are. So I'll give you a quick example of, of some of the exercises that, um, that we use. So this is, um, this is Tammy and she just got a new knee brace. And sometimes like we saw with Sage, they have a tendency to knuckle a little bit and not pick up their feet. So what I do is I ask them to walk across a ladder. So you can see that she just walked across. You could see she was a little bit more exaggerated with the with the leg that had the brace on. So that's a that's a good one. Um, one of my favorite ones, one of my favorite exercises, is called pick up sticks. So if you remember as a kid, there was a game called pick up sticks, where you would have to pull out, you would randomly dump out the box, and you pick out a stick one by one, without moving anything. I was horrible at the game, so I don't know if that's actually how it was supposed to work because I usually was done pretty early on in the game. Um, but I like to use it for, for the dogs and it's super easy. It's super easy to set up. It's just mop handles, broom handles. We use PVC in this example uh, because we have a lot of it here. Um, but we're just asking the dog to pick their way through to solve the problem. And if they're food motivated, this is a great way to feed a snack um, or a meal. So this is Emma uh, that you're going to see here. Emma has, um, uh, had IVDD, and she also, you'll notice, she also has a lucky flipper. One of her front, uh, one of her front wrists um, is basically not all together. So she's got 
a double challenge to overcome, but she's doing really great. So this is Emma in her pickup sticks. Sorry. So that's Emma doing a really good job going through her pickup sticks. You'll notice that she didn't make anything move. And that's really the idea. We don't want to hear toenails clicking. We don't want to see stuff moving. Nothing moves if they don't touch it. And that's the idea. And it's a lot of fun because the game is never the same. Depending on which angle you bring them into the pickup sticks, the puzzle changes. Um, so that's an easy one to set up on a patio or in a living room if you really want to live dangerously. Um, the other one, a couple of others that we do um, is uh, a Cavaletti. So Cavaletti rails are basically, um, they're small small hurdles. It comes, uh, it comes from the horse world. Um, and, but we use these in a lot of different ways. So Bradley is pretty able. He had a um, iliopsoas strain, and we've put his Cavaletti rails pretty close together so that he has to pick up his feet. Never been on one of those, have you? Oh, here we go. Good. And then turn around and go back. Good. Do it one more time. So you could see how exaggerated he had to be to lift up those paws to get through there. So in his particular case, we were really working on um, uh, flexion or, or, or bending his knees and his hips appropriately, uh, but we got the added benefit of some, uh, some proprioception. So let's look at another version of using those Cavaletti and confine, confining, combining that with a weave. So this is Blueberry. Um, blueberry is um, probably 13 or 14. Uh, she's had lots of orthopedic issues, um, but uh, she and her mom do a lot of uh, a lot of training, and uh, Blueberry really really enjoys that and learning new things. So now we've taken those Cavaletti and we've put them on their side, and we're going to combine it and make it a weave. So you can see how she really had to pick up her feet and, and Blueberry does have some challenges with, with sliding her feet. Sometimes she reminds me of a, a grandpa in his slippers walking, uh, walking through the house in the morning uh, with his coffee in one hand, newspaper under the arm kind of thing. Um, so it really encourages her to, uh, to, lift up, uh, to lift up those paws. Now sometimes uh, let's, look at, let's look at the weave without the Cavaletti and you can kind of see how um, this is Titus. He's a bulldog. He has um, two torn ACLs and he's wearing his braces. Um, he's come a long way. He's doing quite well. Um, but you'll see how he has to figure out where he is to, one, not hit the cone, and two, change direction uh, to follow mom and, more importantly, the food that mom has in her hand. He's like, I love coming here, man. I'm not on a diet when I'm here. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Titus is one of my favorites. He's a sweet boy. Um, so you can see how there was a little bit different than what Blueberry was doing on um, on her Cavalettis and Weaves, but still a similar um, a similar exercise. And then one of the last ones that that we use um, uh, in our repertoire to help people uh, help their dogs learn to pick up those feet and feet placement is uh, we put some rings and pads together and ask them to walk through it. So what we have is stepping down into the ring and up onto a squishy pad. So they really have to pay attention to where those feet are, or they're going to catch the back feet and roll over, trip on the pad, something like that. So they have to be very conscious of what they're doing. So this is Daisy. So you could kind of see from Daisy trying to figure out what mom wanted in that exercise, uh, but still having to walk up and over and down into um, into those uh, 
uh, into those rings. So, um, if uh, so, those are just some examples of the exercises that we use here. Uh, but if you if your dog does happen to um, uh, get some wounds on the top of their paws from the knuckling or the dragging um, or wear down uh, the nails to the quick so that you have uh, bloody toenails when you get back, follow your vet's instructions on um, taking care of those because what you don't want is to get um, an infection that comes in through that broken skin. Um, I've become a really big fan of Manuka honey um, as a... Um, as a good uh, wound healer, but listen to your veterinarian um, about how to uh, how to protect those and how to keep those clean. Don't let your dogs lick the um, lick the sores. You can c create a much bigger situation there. So if you need to cover them or bandage them, uh, talk to your veterinarian about um, how to do that. Um, of course, I'm always one for avoiding getting the sores in the first place. I can tell you firsthand that they take forever to heal. Um, and the skin is never quite as strong as it was the first time. You probably also had to maybe clip some hair away uh, to make sure that it doesn't get in the wound. So now you have to wait for the hair to grow back. So it can be another layer of protection. So it's just a, it's, it's a mess. So if you can avoid getting those sores in the first place, that is definitely the best course of action. Okay. All right. Um, I've had a good time talking about knuckling today, and I'm excited to remind everyone that we are coming up on um, the first week of May. And if you've been with us for a while, you know that the first week of May always has National Specially Able Pets Day, which is my favorite day of the year. Um, so much so that we celebrate for the entire week. So this year it is uh, May 3rd, but we are going to start um, uh, celebrating on the 2nd. So we're going to start um, uh, with a special, start the week off with uh, special stories, photos, um, tips on how to take care of, of certain um, um, certain issues that come up with your mobility challenge dogs. Uh, we're going to have a, a special um uh, Facebook Live on that Saturday, which I think is the 8th or the 9th. Um, I hope to have a special guest um, for that. And it's just going to be a lot of fun. It's kind of like Christmas week for me um, because we, we do a lot on our Facebook page. So if you follow us on Facebook, make sure you check in on that. Um, we uh, we do uh, we do quite a bit on that. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about that coming up. So um, it was good to talk to you. Uh, and remember, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, pop those into the um, into the feed. I'll be sure and answer those. And make sure to let me know if you watch it on replay. Just type in hashtag replay, and uh, I'll come pop in and say hi. I uh, hope you guys have a great week. Uh, stay safe. Remember, keep wearing your mask. We're almost there. Um, and uh, go have fun with your dogs. Take care. <laughs>